All right. Hey, good morning. It's great to see you all uh, finding joy this Christmas. Uh, maybe you're at home, sure enough, watching like many of these. It's so good to see folks that we haven't seen in a while. And it's so good to see you today. If you're at home, we hope that you have been singing along, waking the neighbors or whatever is happening there. Maybe you're alone at home, but you're not alone. You matter so much to us. You know, we've said that throughout this, um, this season, we're coming home for Christmas. You've picked up on that. Uh, not, not, not necessarily going home, but we're coming home. And what we've said is we're talking about coming home to Jesus ultimately as we walk through each of the Advent, you know, the lightings of the candles and focuses each week. We're talking about coming home to Christ. It's in John 15 in the message, which is really what we're looking at in this, um, that, that, that translation or paraphrase. We're looking at this, this, uh, season because, of how some familiar text for many of us stories come in a different light. We're going to see that again today. But in, in John 15, Jesus says, if you abide in me, and it says there, if you're at, at home with me and, and I'm at home with you, you'll be at home with me and the Father and the Spirit will be at home, truly at home. We said this year has an opportunity, given us an opportunity, uh, really, in so many ways. You know, a lot of us are not going to go home. For Christmas, We're not going to be with people that we want to be with, perhaps. We're not going to experience a lot of what Christmas has been. So we've said, hey, we've got an opportunity, however. You know, every year as a pastor, I'm always saying, don't miss Jesus, right? That's always the challenge. Don't miss him in, in the craziness, in all of the schedule, in all of your parties, the running around, going shopping and overeating and all that we've made Christmas out to be. Don't miss Jesus, and this year we have an opportunity, maybe like never in your lifetime, just to slow down a bit and say, let's, let's truly focus on him. And so I, I want, want to say it again. If, if Christmas really is all about Jesus, we say that every year in light of all the activities. If it really is about Jesus, listen, you won't miss a thing this year. And so we've given you every opportunity uh, to join us uh, along the way and to, yes, sure enough, experience uh, Christ in your own personal life through our Advent guide as we are together, all of us walking together through this Christmas season. And you can see there we have a, a QR code again that is going to serve as an opportunity for you. Just a reminder, a bug there that you can, you can go there and find it on our website. Just go to our website later today and you can find all of the information there that's going to be so helpful for you. We started the, the Advent season with this idea that hope is not wishful thinking. It's actually trusting in what God has already set in motion and, and experiencing what he has already put in place. Last week, we said that peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of something else. Peace is a lot like joy, as we'll discover today. It's not the absence of tension and struggle or pain. Or how about this grief? A lot to grieve this year. A lot to grieve this Christmas season. But instead it's the presence of something else. Ultimately the presence of someone else. And being in close proximity with that someone. Uh, you can imagine if you've been around here much. We would say it this way. Hope is found in a person. Peace Joy is found in a person. Last week we said that person is Savior. He's the Messiah, the liberating King, and he is Master. He's the Lord of all. This is the great proclamation at Christmas time. So today we're going to come home to joy. All right, so you can grab your Bible and you can turn uh, in your Bible to Luke chapter 2. Again, if you're home, we're going to be in Luke 2 here in a moment. But before we get there, I want to clearly define Joy. What is joy? Is joy, um, you know, a lot of people think it's a denial of reality. Some of us think, well, it's, it's, it's an emotion or it's a, a decision. Is it, is it a decision? Is it an attitude? How can I have more joy in my life? I like how Randy Alcorn defines it. Here's an, here's an extended uh, definition, and I love this. Look at this. He says, joy is something entirely different from happiness. Now, most of, we talk about this a lot, and we have even in recent months. We all have a sense that it's something other than happiness. Joy, in the biblical context, is not an emotion. Joy brings us peace in the middle of a storm. You see the tie with joy and peace. He says joy is something that God deposits into us through the Holy Spirit. Remember, joy is the fruit 
of the Spirit. There, uh, there is a big difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is an emotion and temporary. Joy is an attitude of the heart. So to be clear, uh, as we move into this, a simple definition there is joy is an attitude of the heart. But as we'll see today, it's much more than that. Joy is a decision. And God desires for all of his children to experience joy. God's desire is for you to be happy in him and to experience joy. But watch this. His main purpose in your life is not to make you just happy based on circumstance, happenstance, uh, not to just give you comfort, but to find joy in relationship with him. That is where joy comes from, as we've noted, in close proximity with the person of Jesus. You show me a joyful person, truly joyful, I'll show you someone who's walking closely with Jesus. Would people describe you as joyful? Are you a joy-filled person? You say, well, I don't know. I'm not sure. Ask them. (laughs) Ask your spouse. Ask your children. Ask people that you know. Am I, do you, do I come across as a joyful person? Well, let's talk about that. Christian joy, here it is. Here's how I'm defining it. Christian joy is an attitude of the heart. Yes, but it's much more than that. It is produced by the Holy Spirit as he reveals to us the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. All right. So it's not just a feeling though. Joy can produce happy feelings in us. I'm going to say it this way. Joy comes when we find ourselves in God's presence and in his will. We'll see that today. We're going to look at the story again in Luke 2. You can imagine the shepherds, right? They discovered that they're a part of God's will in the world and it brought great joy. Joy is a response response to his presence. It's a response to the fact that he's come to us. So here it is. Joy comes in the arrival of God. Joy comes in the presence of God and joy comes in the sharing of God. Joy is contagious. If you hang out with a joyful person, you start to get joyful yourself. All right. So we're going to talk today about how joy comes in the arrival of God. All right. First of all, joy comes in the arrival of God. This is the source of all joy in this passage. Think about it. The fact that God has come is the entire reason for joy, not only in this passage, but I'm going to make the case for all of life. Our joy, watch this, finds its source in our salvation. You could say it more more specifically, in our Savior. So look at verse 10 of of Luke chapter 2. The angel said, don't be afraid. We've noted that's the most common command in Scripture. And he's saying this because they were terrified. We see uh, in the verses ahead of that. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. And now comes this good news. This good news that he's about to announce is meant for everyone. This word good news is the word euangelion in the Greek. You, you wrapped up in there is the word angel, okay, messenger, Message, good news, euangelion. We get the word evangelism or evangelist. Evangel, uh, the evangel is the angel. We, we sang about it earlier. The herald who brings the good news. Look at verse 11. Here's the good news. We've looked at this uh, past couple of weeks. A savior, look how he's described, has just been born in David's town. A savior who is Messiah and master. We've noted that's a great translation. Christos is Messiah, liberating king. And he's master, he's Lord, he's leader. This is the description of the the rescue that has come to us. Over 300 times in the Old Testament, this is referenced. 400 years previously, Isaiah says in Isaiah 9, verse 6, that there's coming a light. Upon a people who need a rescue. He's he's speaking directly to Israel. But now this thing has come to the entire world. Now this Savior, Messiah, Master, Lord of all has come. And then look at this. Not only the greatest birth announcement of all time. But the greatest news of all time. Verse 12. This is what you're to look for. A baby. Wrapped in a blanket. And lying in a manger, you're going to find a baby wrapped up in a blanket in a feed trough. 
This is the this is the expression, uh, the, the definition of what has come to, to save us. He has come, the long-awaited Messiah. Again, as we sang about earlier, the great anticipation of his coming. But watch this. Advent season really is a celebration of the fact that he has come. I'm going to make that, that very clear today and why that should produce joy in all of us. And, and yet it's looking forward as well. You know, Isaac Watts, who wrote the hymn, Joy to the World, is actually, the song is as much about his second coming as it is his first. If you're like me, you're singing those words and saying, I'm not so sure that's really happened yet. He rules the world with truth and grace. Surely he does in the spiritual realm. How does that come into play? It's happening as the kingdom of God's advance, and it's going to happen when he comes again, we anticipate his coming. There's great anticipation in something that's coming. Ask any child who's anticipating Christmas, right? All the kids among us know what it is to wait for something, and it's hard. For many of us, it feels like just a few days away for our kids. It can't come soon enough. There's a lot of joy, even in the waiting But you know, the real joy comes in the finding, doesn't it? The reality of that thing coming. I know when we play hide and seek, right, with kids, there's a lot of fun in the anticipation and the searching, but the joy is in the finding. That's when all the giggling and all the screaming takes place is in the finding. And what I want you to know today is the long-awaited Savior, friends. Listen, he has come. This may seem self-evident at Christmas time, but have we lulled ourselves to sleep with this incredible news that he has come? I love the story of the little boy on Christmas Day. He's been waiting and he opens all the gifts and you know, there's wrapping paper all over the den or wherever they are. And he's, he, he's there, he's got all his toys. He's been up since 5.30 in the morning, but he's finished. He's done and he's sitting right in the middle of the room and, and it looks like he's about to start crying. And maybe all of us as kids have experienced this. Dad says, what's, what's, what is it? You know, and he says, I wish Mary and Joseph would have another baby. <laughs> because he knows it's all over, right? I mean, there's great joy in the celebration and anticipation. There's great joy in the tearing opens, open of gifts. But listen, here's the point. There's not going to be another baby. He has come. He's done all that's necessary. We are the visited planet. This is the great divine disruption that has taken place already. He's already come. Mary and Joseph aren't going to have another baby. There's no need for another baby. He has come. He died on the cross for our sins, having lived the perfect life. The sacrificial lamb takes on our sin. He's died. He's been buried and raised again. This has already happened. He's not coming to do that again, friends. And that is cause enough for us to rejoice. Watch this. Regardless of what life brings to us, We can rejoice every single day. I'm going to make a bold statement here. As a Christian, if you are a Christian, you've received his grace. You've trusted in Christ with your sin. He he took your sins upon the cross. He rose again, again, putting in place what is coming for you. You should be joyful all the time. All of the time. You say, well, Jeff, you just don't understand what I'm going, all the time. But Jeff, this has been such a hard year, all of the time. Now, this sounds like a bold statement, but it's actually the Apostle Paul. It's in the Word of God. You probably know Philippians 4, right? Look what it says in the message. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in Him. Rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. By the way, rejoice is the verb form of joy. It's an expression of the joy we have. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them, not against them. Help them see that the master, watch this, is about to arrive. He could show up in any minute. The Lord is near. He's close at hand. His presence is with us, but he's coming again. And here's what's interesting about this. Rejoice is again the verb form okay of of the word joy but it's also a command 
It's an imperative command. Rejoice. And and this is a, a strange command when you think about it, isn't it? It's not don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Stop sinning. Be filled with joy. And I could argue then, because it's a command not to be joyful is to be disobedient and sinful. If we truly understand what joy is, joy is not just an emotion. Joy can produce great emotion, as we'll see here in this story. Paul, by the way, is writing from prison. You may know this. This is not based on circumstances. And he says, be joyful. You know, as your pastor, I'm, I'm often uh, seeking to help and encourage people, pray for people. Been on the phone or reaching out. I talked to one of our members on Friday and then again yesterday because uh, he'd been struggling a bit and had just found out on Friday that he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And so yesterday I'm on the phone with him and his wife and we're together and praying together and, and how this works often for me. I'm the one who ends up being encouraged because of the joy in the midst of not good news, but because the good news has already been announced. The bad news that comes still brings about joy because our joy, watch this, the source of our joy is found in our salvation and in the Savior who's already come regardless of what comes our way. That is Christian joy. Christian joy blows the minds of those who don't know the Lord. Uh, I had a dear friend years ago, Dr. Jack Jernigan, was in a small group with me. Uh, He's about 83 at the time. Jack has gone on to be with the Lord since this time. But uh, we were gathering together in our small group. And and Jack came over. His wife drove him over. And and he, he notes that for the past couple of weeks, he says, I can't put my head down. Uh, I got, I've got a problem in my, in my neck and I cannot, I can't, can't even put my head down. It hurts so bad. And I said, I said, Jack, that is horrible. And he, and he says, you know, actually, it's actually been a real blessing because I am, I'm looking at things that I don't normally see. Um, I'm looking at the trees or beauty. I'm looking at leaves. I don't look at, I'm looking at birds. I, I'm seeing clouds that I don't normally look at. And so, yes, it hurts. But hey, you know what? In a lot of ways, it's been a real, it's been a real gift to me. Jack is obeying Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice always. Again, if you missed it, I'm going to say it. Rejoice. Paul tells us to rejoice in all things. Let me ask you again. Are you a joyful person? Do people see you as one filled with joy? Be joyful always as a command were to remember that our source of joy is Christ himself. He produces joy and peace and yes, happiness because we're happy in him, which brings glory to him. You know, as a father, one of the greatest joys that I experience, so I'm thinking about God, our father, when my kids express that they love being my kids, Right through all the years that, uh, and, and even now as adults, even more able to express that. When my children say, "Dad, I love being your father. I mean, your your son or daughter. I love that you're my father," and, and they express that maybe to friends. Like, yeah, I want my friends to come over, and I mean, our friends love to come to our house. Can we have them over for dinner? Or you know, our house is always with twins and, and Travis. It's always been the place to be. And that's always brought such joy to me. When your kids are like, Dad, you're awesome. And in the same way, when we say, God, you're our source of joy. You're the one that we love. We want everybody to be a part of our family. I, want, I, wish, I wish everybody had my dad. We bring glory to him when we point to him as the source of our joy. But listen, here's here's the point I'm making, this first point. Spending a lot of time here because I want you to see this. The source of your salvation and mine is salvation that has come. The source of our joy is the Savior. Full stop. Not anything else. All of our joy in all of life recalibrates all the way back to him. It's why in Luke 10... 
When Jesus sends out the disciples, they come back and he says, you know, they're amazed at how they can, they can, you know, cast out demons and all kinds of power in his name. And he says, hey, that's all good. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. When's the last time you rejoiced over the fact that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? Friend, that is the source of joy, and it is the complete source of joy in this entire passage. And again, I could argue in all the world, in all of history, and into the future, and for all eternity. We rejoice because the Savior has come. Begs the question, has he come into your life? Maybe you haven't recently celebrated that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life because you've not received him as your Savior. If you haven't, today is your day. Maybe you haven't been rejoicing because you've not been content in him alone. And you've not been drawing in close proximity to him. Maybe you're not finding joy because you, even in the arrival of Jesus, even in your own life, because you've been seeking happiness in other places. Listen, we learn so much about Jesus, even from his arrival, of how we are to live as well. He comes in obscurity. He comes simply to do the will of the Father. When you live, listen, when you live content with obscurity, content to do the will of the Father, to be faithful to him in whatever he's called you to, not to what he's called to someone else, but in the moment to be a faithful presence every single day, that is joy. And that, as we've talked about, is success in life. You see, so joy is a focus before it's a feeling. So stop chasing after a feeling because here's here's what happens. We think joy is a feeling, so we run after a feeling. When the feeling doesn't come, we're joyless. That's not joy. Joy is an attitude of the heart. It's the fruit of the spirit. Are you a rejoicer? We should rejoice in the Lord this week because Christ has come. We should rejoice every single day. He has come to us, friends. Is your name written in the book of life? Consider this. You're saved. You've been rescued. You're going to heaven when you pass. You will never die. Whatever comes your way, he's working for your good. His spirit has been given for you to have power over sin and you can continue to worship him all the days of your life and into eternity because your eternal destiny is set. Let me ask you, do you believe it? That should bring joy into your life. If you believe it, live like it. Live like it. Be joy-filled all of the time. See, there was a generation that, that, wasn't, that didn't have an endless supply of unhappiness coming at them constantly. Constant access to everybody else's happiness. And we, we say it often here. Comparison is the thief of joy. Because what happens in our day now is that we can find ourselves looking at everybody else's happiness. They got a better Christmas coming their way. They got a better uh, house. They got a better, they're having a lot more fun. They got a better, they're eating a better meal than I'm eating. We see everybody's stuff, right? Their best moment on Instagram or their best joyful dance on, on TikTok or whatever we were looking at. My dad used to say this, all that glitters is not gold. And too often we, our joy is stripped away. We, we, we allow the joy that God's given us to be taken away. And it's already come to us. Because we find ourselves always, uh, you know, running after other things. And not being content in him. The joy of our salvation, right, is our strength. Many of us feel defeated, depleted because we've lost our joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord. And you're missing that joy in your life perhaps. So the joy comes in his arrival. I want you to see this. Joy comes in his presence. Here's where we find our our memory verse for this week. I want you to memorize this verse. It's out of Ecclesiastes 5.20. It's God's gift. God deals out joy in the present. The now. We've talked about this a little bit. This is so important. The thing that I've learned. How I can overcome anxiety and worry maybe even shame and regret in my life is to focus on the present. I want you to think about this. Surely God's the God of the past. 
We can look back and say, oh, he's been faithful. He's the God of the future. We know this. But really, he's the God of the present. He's the great I am. He's always present tense. So when you go into the past without him, because he's not there, he's here in the present. The past is done. You don't need to go back to the past. We'll never go back to the past. When you go back to the past without him, all that you have then is regret and shame. You go into the future without him, all you have is anxiety and worry. He's called you to be in the moment. This is where the joy is found. In the present, in the focus of what he's given you right now. Friends, you've got to live this way. I plead with each of you, joy is found in the present, in the now. Joy comes in the arrival of God. Joy comes in the presence of God. Remember, he is Emmanuel. And he keeps on coming. He keeps on arriving. Matthew 1, you know this. It's earlier in the Christmas story. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. We sing about it. We've sung about it even today. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which means God with us. He's with us. There's joy in the arrival. But don't miss this week. Don't miss this. He's always arriving. Are you looking for him? Are you watching for his presence to show up? Now he may not show up with angel armies. But he shows up in the small moments. Small acts of kindness. In a, in a, in a personal conversation with someone. He, he shows up as we, as we find ourselves. Watch this. Position ourselves to hear from him. I want you to stop every single day. We've given you all that you need to to delve into God's word and to hear the story yet again from a different angle every single day. This week, remember, joy is found in the present moment and it's found in his presence as it comes to us. I love what it says in Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life in your presence. You see, it is fullness of joy. Joy comes in his presence, so you have to come into his presence to experience it. It comes as we consider his salvation. At your right hand are pleasures forever. Joy comes in the arrival of God. It comes in the the presence of God. And then we'll close with this. Joy comes in the sharing of God. You know where this story goes. Watch this. If If the joy, the gift of salvation terminates on us, then we're done. You see, we're blessed to be a blessing. The blessing of God that comes to us is meant to be shared with others. Look at verse 15. As the angel choir withdrew into heaven and sheep herders talked it over, let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. Good news has got to be shared, right? I have a good friend, a dear friend who told me two weeks ago that he and his wife are pregnant. And he told me for two reasons. He said, we're not telling anybody, but as our pastor, we want you to know so you can be praying for us. And he told me the other reason is because he's really happy about it, right? Good news has got to be shared. Now he's told me not to share. I'm not telling you who it is. I'm not sharing with you. But, but if, I, if I was able and when I'm able, I'll be sharing it with others because good news is meant to be shared. Look at verse 16. They left running, in fact, and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger, seeing was believing for them. In other words, it, it confirmed everything that the angel had told them. Look at verse 17. They told everyone. They met what the angels had said about this child. All who heard the sheep herders were impressed. They marveled. They wondered at what they heard. And friends, this should be our response. Same response. We have heard as well. We should be telling everyone. We we should be, be telling it from the mountaintop. We should get on the phone and tell others. We should talk talk about it in conversations. We should email it, text it, put it, whatever you do, get it out there. Be a news, good news teller. Be a herald of this news. We should be like the shepherds. The Savior has come. When's the last time you told someone about Jesus? I mean, really, like really shared what he has done for you. You can do that. It's a simple way to say, I've encountered him. And in our context today, you know, our 
with, with kind of relative truth, right? You can say, this is my experience. You can't argue with that. Here's what Christ has done for me because of what he has accomplished. Look at what it says in, in verse 19. Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear, deep within herself. I'm challenging us all to do this. The sheep herders, okay, in contrast, return and let loose. They went next level, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly as they were told. There's joy in the arrival of God. There's joy in the presence of God. And there's joy in the sharing, the telling of God. See, joy begats more joy. When you share Christ with others, it brings greater joy in your life. And it spreads the joy with others. Don't you want to be a joy teller? A joy spreader, a rejoicer. Encourage all of us to do that. This week, you have someone that needs to hear that the Savior has come. But I want to ask you as we close our time, and all of us online, have you received the Savior who has come? He's come once. He's coming again. And it's time for all of us to make right before a holy God. The only way to do that is receive him as Savior. He's come, he, he died on the cross. And, and notice this, it's been our theme throughout the year, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith for the joy, watch this, for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look, he, he set joy before him. Now watch this, there was not joy in the pain. There wasn't joy in, 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 in the, the pain that came through the cross. Instead, the joy was the, was the guaranteed outcome that was to come. What, many of us know this. There is a difference between walking through pain with purpose and pain where we see no purpose at all. And, and yet we walk through pain like Jesus. We go through challenging seasons with a purpose. God is working in all things to draw us closer to him. But Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. And listen, don't miss this. Of all the people that he saw, of every face that came into the divine mind of God while he's on the cross, one of those faces was yours. And it was enough to kill him. It was enough to keep him there to die on that cross so that you could experience the joy of his arrival in your life as Savior of your life and that you could experience the joy that comes through his presence in your life. And you could experience the joy of sharing the salvation that's come to you in Christ. Have you received him? Today is your day. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let's pray. Friend, right now, wherever you are, and all the rest of us who, who know you, I want you to be praying with me and for these who are watching now. Friend, if you don't know Christ, today is your day. Right now, in this moment, he has come. He's died on the cross, he rose again. He's done it all. There's nothing more that he needs to be done than, than needs to be done for you to receive him as savior of your life. Receive him now. Just say, Lord, come into my heart. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I believe that you've taken away my sin. I receive your forgiveness right now. Lord, make me the person you've created me to be. And for all of us, I want you to ponder for a moment. Have you forgotten the joy of your salvation? Has 2020 just beat you down so much? that you've lost all joy. Friend, you've lost nothing if he is your savior. Commit yourself anew to him right now. Lord, help me to remember what you have done and may I be a source of joy for others who don't know you and need to know you this Christmas season. Lord, we go to share your good news with the entire world. You have come. There's joy. 
because our Savior has come to us. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.